All right. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Um, even a little more gain than I expected. Hi, everybody. Um, I, thanks for coming to the SPX uh, Warts and All Memoir uh, Programming event, this panel with Angela Fanch, Ali Erico, Kayla E, and Tara Booth, all in front of you here. There is a, there's been, I would say, over the last perhaps eight, five to eight years, I'll say, a really big resurgence in the kind of, of deep dive, no holds barred kind of memoir that we generally uh, think about artists like Ariel Bordeaux. Um, we think about artists like um, Julie Doucet, uh, Julie Doucet, sorry. And um, we have this kind of, I would say, this rising group of artists who have kind of taken on that mantle and are doing something even um, beyond maybe that, working with that kind of as their past, or maybe not even having, when starting, this, starting the work, having even known about it. Um, so I want to introduce all of our panelists. We'll talk a little bit about their work, and then we'll jump right in with questions. But for all of you, uh, my name is Alex Hoffman. I'm the publisher of Field Mouse Press. A 501c3 nonprofit. We're over at Table M2, and I'll invite you all to tell us where you're at if you're at, if you're tabling or where people can find your books. Um, so uh, first off, I want to introduce Angela. Angela Fanch, uh, most uh, most commonly associated with or I, the thing I first think about is Angela's book with Cram Books. And does anybody know where Cram's at at the show? It's remember their table number. Um, but Me and Knight, published back in 2021, um, and Angel's had a bunch of work in a variety of different anthologies, and then um, the performance of a love note with Entropy Editions. Um, and they're based in Chicago or Minneapolis, I can't remember. Um, and Angela's work largely, Angela's done a bunch of autobio work, and then your new stuff, which I want to talk a little bit about, is almost more like dream logic. There's a lot of there's a lot of kind of um, working through problems in a very kind of metaphysical way. So things that I want to get into next is Ali Erico. Um, Ali's uh, recent book, Froggy World, Volume One, came out from Cram Books. Excellent, excellent comic. You should get it. I'm pretty sure they have co copies still, but if you're unlucky, they may have sold out already. Um, but Ali's been kind of building up a portfolio over the last few years. Really funny, really insightful comics, um, sometimes about getting hit by a car, um, sometimes <laughs> other fun stuff about living in a city. Um, next up, we have Kayla E. Kayla's been working in a variety of different locations for a while. Um, I think the first thing I was aware of with your work was the work in Black Eye 3. Wow, um, that's so cool. So that's, that's when I first ran into your stuff. Um, and then uh, really excited to see the excerpt in Now 13, which is out at the show today at the Fanographics table. And then the debut full length graphic novel of Precious Rubbish coming out next year in 2025. Really excited to talk about everything that you're working through with this, this comic. And last but not least, uh, Tara Booth, whose work has, I think, uh, Unwell is the first thing I think I formally came across, which yeah. was the Kushmini, um, our, our Latvian friends. Um, but really steady publishing throughout the last eight or so years and recently releasing Processing with Drawn and Quarterly, also at the show today. This is a debut. I think technically the release date is the 17th. Is that right? right. So brand new at the show today, so um, at the D&Q table. Um, quick round of applause for all of our <laughs> wonderful fans. So the first thing I really wanted to dig into, and the images are, are placed up here mostly for my amusement and not for any other reason. I just like the panels or I just like the pages. Um, and I tried to make sure that everybody got equal representation. Um, so I wanted to chat through, when we think about memoir, right, the first thing that I think about is this idea that memoir is essentially something you're putting to paper for a dis distinct purpose. 
And oftentimes, there is, in that purpose, there can be, let's say, modifications. Let's say maybe we're, we're tweaking a story a little bit to get a better punchline. Sometimes we're, we're putting down something very specifically to memorialize it or to process it. Um, and so I wanted to start there with the idea of processing, of catharsis, of the reason, perhaps, that you make comics or the reason why you do the work that you do. Um, and I'd like to open it up to the whole panel just to kind of get a sense of when you're, when you're in your artistic practice now, doing what you're doing, especially with the kind of comics you make, what's your goal? Are, are you really churning through the past to try and make sense of it or to try and build up from that? Are you trying to make fun of it? Are you trying to um, memorialize it? What's, what's, your, what's your general, I guess, approach, mental approach to the work? Do you want to like, go down the line? Oh, me first? OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, my approach, uh, what's the question? Like, yeah. <laughs> what's, your, what's your general approach to the work? Why, you know, when you're thinking about the reason you're making like autobio work, or the reason that you're, like, are you doing it to kind of um, synthesize your history? Are you trying to use it to help you get a better understanding of your own self? Are you, you know, what's the, what's your goal when you're making comics? Uh, it's probably a combination of all those things that you described, but I guess like for me, I think the day to day um, in, in life, there's just like so many storylines like happening all at once. Like there's so many um, like, occurrences um, minute to minute and like with when you make an autobio comic you have to like uh, for me I select one storyline and contextualize it and then like make it um, like solidify it um, and then I could go back and remember it and it's cool it's like um, I don't know it's like a stamp um, and yeah, like uh, sometimes when I'm like lost in life, like it helps me ground myself. Um, I think it's I think autobio comics is a practice that everyone should really do. Um, it's like a form of journaling, uh, but with image. So there's just more to it. Like when you just write like straightforward writing, um, it becomes like flowery, poetic romantic, but with the image, you have to like kind of struggle with it making sense with the text. So there's just more to that. Uh, yeah, I think that's my answer. <laughs> I love that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, you know, you're, you're right. Like when we teach children to read, right, they often are taught with images alongside of text, right? Oh yeah, Rosetta Stone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you're, you're you, you know, the idea of the image having to, to, you know, be processed alongside of text is really important. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Angela said. It's kind of like, when you're moving through life, like, it doesn't stop, and it's hard to, like, ascertain what is kind of important to hold on to and what is not, but then when you sit down and draw it, you, ha you have to make those decisions um, of what you're going to remember and what is, like, can be thrown away, and uh, memories kind of like build up and there's nothing to like get them off your back until you like process them so that's a way of doing it is like putting them on paper um, and then yeah it's like a weight off your back for me <laughs> yeah sorry just to add on I feel like at the end of your life what what else do you have except your memories <laughs> yeah there's also like an aspect of it where I'm like I just like when I die, like, I want someone to know this. Yeah. Yeah. That sense of wanting to, you know, wanting to, you know, to make a mark. I think that's important. Yeah. That's why we, that's, that's why we do what we do. I think a lot of people, you know. Tara, what about you? For me, it's, um, it's just like always been a, drawing and writing has always been a coping mechanism. Um, like since I can remember, 
I was always just like writing down my feelings and drawing how I felt. And I agree with a lot of what you guys said. It's like it's it's like one of one of the healthier ways that I'm able to work through feelings, um, especially since I like I stopped drinking. I try not, you know, I catch myself like binge watching TV shows or binging anything, any other type of anything I can, and um, like trying to shove the feelings down. And like to this day, I still have to remind myself that like. The only thing that really lifts that weight, it's not avoiding, but it's like working through. And that's that's what my what my comics are really. Like they're whether or not they're being published, I'm gonna make them. And also like reality is something that uh, feels very like unstable for me. I could have like this amazing connection, amazing talk with somebody one moment and then it sort of like fades away and becomes ab abstract over time. So something that I do to ground myself is to like draw that moment, remember that that connection was real and it's a way for me to sort of like, yeah, self-soothe and not focus so much on like uncertainty. No way out but through, yeah. essentially. It's a really good question, um, and I, w I really, I wish it felt cathartic for me, uh, and I honestly don't know why I made this work. Uh, I started making these comics like in absolute isolation, starting in 2013 is when I first drew my uh, first Precious Rubbish strip, and I was embedded in my biological family. Uh, I had moved back to Texas after I graduated from college and was like, caretaking for my bio mom and just in the trauma. And for some reason, I had this compulsion to start investigating childhood trauma. I had no language for what I had experienced. I was still in major active addiction, um, like with my abusers, like living that life. And I, I was just continuing to make this work. It was very, it was way, way more guarded at that time. And then eventually, like as I got sober and as I came out and like met my wife and like my life really started to get better and I started to really, I think, understand what the purpose of making this work was and it really is to make sense of what happened to me as a child. Yeah. So all of my memoir comics are about my childhood. I'm not making work about my life right now. And like I said, the vast majority of it I made in isolation. Like this book is basically my debut as a cartoonist. Yeah. And when I put all of it together, even still like making the work is just horribly painful. Um, it's just like torture, truly. And I think that the, the catharsis, ha the one benefit I have found that I think really helps me understand why I said yes to these impulses all these years has been sharing my work with other people. Mm -hmm. And like sharing my work with other people is like, oh my God, like I mirror them, they mirror me, and that's where the healing happens. And like that has been utterly life changing. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like all the good stuff happens now that I'm done with the book. Yeah. I, I totally get that. You know, it's like, it's almost like scrubbing out an infected wound, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, this is not going to heal unless you open it back up and it's going to hurt like hell. Yeah, but really you gotta, does. But you got to squirt that out, you know, alcohol or iodine or whatever in there. That's got to go in there to clean that out before you can, can properly heal. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I, the other thing I wanted to really just get at or un get your take on or understanding on um, as we work through your, the things that you're, you're kind of working on, each of you has a very, I would say, unique style. Um, you're really, you're, you're playing with image in a very distinct way. Like I think while I see a lot of comparisons to your work, um, so we've, we've got Angela's work on the, on the audience's left here, and we've got Tara's work on the audience's right. Um, previously, um, we had Kayla's work on the audience's left and Ali's work on the audiences, right? Um, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about the work, about your work as a group, as a, as a group, is how unique it is, but then how it really still digs down into the depths of the human condition and really pulls out the really important stuff and makes it, uh, makes it uh, just, I guess, sometimes digestible, sometimes um, more profound, sometimes more profane, you know? And I think that's, that's, uh, that's, that's something that I think is really critical and really important about your work. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on, on the act of making. Like why, you know, 
you, each of you have used different materials or started somewhere and ended up somewhere else and have settled into a voice perhaps or a style that seems to work for you right now. And I'd like to get a, a sense of like what, what's been driving that, why, you know, um, why, the, why the gouache or why the, the panels in, with stark ink or why the pencils, and, you know, or, you know, why the little Lulu-esque, you know, wartime comic style, like what, what has driven you to that spot? Uh, for me, um, it's a lot of it is like an efficiency thing. Like when I draw, I get really, really like tunnel vision, like wrapped up in it, and I can't like think about anything else. Like, and it takes me so long. Like I'll just sit there and like make you know tiny, try to draw every single detail. And so choosing materials um, is like trying to figure out what is going to stop me from going into that. Uh, kind of like loop um, because eventually you have to finish the comic. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, Do you feel an urgency? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I have to get this out right now and it takes so long to draw a comic. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel that too, definitely. Like, there, yeah. I feel like it, I spend a lot of time on my paint, like they're fully painted comics, so it takes some time, but you can kind of see how quickly I'm like working with the paint. But I went to art school and I, and I studied painting in school, so that was just sort of, that's just sort of what I love to do. And um, it's like, I get into a flow state with painting, like more than I do with anything else, really. So I just really, like the, the process of using paint is really like meditative to me. and and comforting and then I guess another aspect of it is feeling like even if the stories suck like <laughs> people can find some enjoyment and just looking at like the brush strokes and everything like that uh, the origin story of why my comics look the way they do is like kind of fucked up which is the case with like every every answer to any question <laughs> in my case but I am also a classically trained visual artist and started drawing like nib and ink like big pages um, and then when I was like living in Texas with my bio family I like had this revelation that I didn't deserve to take up any space at all so I threw away all the art I made and then I was like if I'm gonna draw, it's gonna be digital. And I want it to have no footprint. And I don't want it to like cost money to make. I don't wanna to have to store it. I don't want it to take up physical space. And so that's how I started making comics, like as an adult, was working digitally. And since then, I've just become so comfortable working digitally. And it helps because like I'm making comics about like abuse fractured memory and so by working digitally I'm able as I recover and and do more work in trauma recovery and become more sober over time I'm remembering things differently like I'm memories are coming back and I'm able to go back into this digital work and literally rewrite it and like redraw the panels and like get closer and closer to the to the truth of what happened to me. And in terms of like the little Lulu-esque um, aspect to it, so I grew up reading like a lot of mid-century kids comics and found them like really comforting and really beautiful and clean and just not the life that I had. And so as an adult, I really enjoy like taking those and reappropriating them and like telling the story of what actually happens to a kid. Like we don't all live in Riverdale, you know, like it's that's just not what life looks like. At least my childhood was nothing like that. So it looks very similar in that way, but uh, it's telling like much deeper, darker, um, more honest stories of childhood suffering. I feel like I can really relate to like, I don't know, it doesn't get brought up that much, but you were talking about like taking up space and mm -hmm. not being comfortable doing that. Like I went to school for painting and, and like, yeah, there's just something that's like so terrifying about working on this huge canvas. So you're, you're expecting that somebody's gonna wanna put that on their wall. You're expecting that someone's gonna wanna spend money on it. It's like, there's, it's, it's a bold. lot, it's bold. Yeah. And I st like, even still, I have a really hard time scaling up my stuff. It's like, does anybody really wanna see it that big? So like working small has always been my comfort zone. That's really interesting. Yeah. I have a similar thing with like using cheap materials. Like I can't yeah. draw on like good paper yeah. because I'm like, if I fuck it up, I'm wasting it. Like, <laughs> yeah. well, why are we so mean to ourselves? <laughs> Just like takes the pressure off. Yeah. 
I use, I use copy paper for my oh. autobio comics. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I draw really small. They're like no shit. This small maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, uh, when I uh, when I first started doing it like autobio comics, I read Gabrielle Bell's um, book Truth is Fra Fragmentary mm -hmm. and um, I was like really impressed. I just assumed she drew the comics every day because like it goes from like it's like a challenge to like um, to draw autobio comic of, for all of July and so I was just like whoa that's so cool like she did that like I want to try to do that and then I did that for all of like April and I was like drinking a lot so it helped me um, I don't know like when you get drunk and you're sad you get into like this mood and you don't know what to do with it so you just I just like drew like I don't know, like did my little panels. Um, I don't drink anymore, but like the most autobio comics I made, like Me and Night was like my darkest time when I like was heavily drinking. Um, yeah. Um, wait, what was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> the question was largely about style, how you came. Because I, well, what, let's let, let me. Oh, style. Bit, okay. Specifically to your work, because. One of the things we've seen is that after Me and Night in 2021, your style kind of goes through, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a radical change, but the, the pacing changes. It gets more, um, I would say, claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. Maybe it gets a little more frantic. Um, at, where before it was, it, maybe this makes sense to me now that I'm thinking about it, is this idea of, well, I was, I, was, I was using alcohol to get into a certain space where I could process things, and it mm -hmm. maybe wasn't the most uh, healthy thing for me at that time, but it was, it was a comfortable thing, and I was able to use that, and that's why my comics maybe looked the way they did at that point. And now that I'm not doing that, they obviously had to change, because why wouldn't they? Yeah. I also have a rule, I can only spend like one hour on an autobio comic. Wow. So wow. I can only do one that hour. After one hour, the autobio comic is cooked. Like, you <laughs> like it's not good anymore. And it has to be four panels. I've tried six, but like for some reason, one, two, three, four is like the best way to like encapsulate a story of, in your life or like a concept. I agree. Like the six, just makes it sound like I'm telling you about like a, my day and you're just like, why? <laughs> but like one, two, three, four, it's just like, okay, it's just like a clip, you know? That's fascinating. Because you know, there's a lot of folks that have settled into that four panel model. Sometimes it's because it's for the elegance. Sometimes it's for the, the kind of like the naturalness of it. Um, I think about John Hankowitz as a cartoonist who is making some really obscure kind of weird stuff, but the four panels always seems to work out really well for him. And then you think about Gabby Bell, another great cartoonist who uses that four panel almost exclusively. John Porcelino um, uses that quite frequently. Well, she does She does six panels. Oh, she does? That's yeah, right. she right, does six right. panels, and she does it really well. Yeah. I always feel like when I, I and maybe this is, this is me, but whenever I'm looking at someone's work, you know, their, their autobio work, I'm looking at, you know, the things that they've made. I have a sense of, and maybe this is, maybe this is not a helpful framing for you, or maybe it is. I want to kind of just run it by you without ha having never spoken to you about it before, um, of this kind of like dichotomy between things being open and things being closed. The idea that not necessarily that it's truthful, but it's openness is almost like honesty where closeness is like guarded um, and a good example of, of closed auto bio if I can use one would be uh, the fan, two fanographics books that Lucy nicely put out that mm -hmm. feels very closed it feels like I'm I don't like I'm hiding from the feelings that I'm having in this moment and I'm, I'm putting this on paper but it, it, it doesn't express where I was actually at mentally or physically in that space Whereas with all of your work, I, I feel even if the lines are very tight, or even if there's if it's messy, or even if it's mm -hmm. if it doesn't see, you know, it's it feels very like 
honest. And I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Like, how do you, how, when you're thinking about autobio, or when you're thinking about writing comics, how, how important is it to you that the work is open or is honest to what you're, what you're doing? Or are you tweaking things to get a better punchline? Are you, you m moving things around so it makes more sense? What's your, what's your thought there? Yeah. Um, when, I, when I first started making comics, I, I was really like using it as an exercise to just like figure out how to love myself, which sounds so like corny. But I was just like, I hated myself so much and I was like so ashamed to be in like any kind of space no matter what, what it was. And I was like, I don't know, just wanting to be somebody else so badly. So, so there were, I moved across the country and I was just like, I'm gonna just like start putting who I am on the paper and like if people are into it, then I'll know that they're down for what, I, what I've got to offer. <laughs> so um, that's one part of it. I try to be pretty open about my stuff, but the thing that I have trouble with, I, I try to make myself the butt of every joke because the, yeah, I have trouble with, when it comes to involving other people who are acting like assholes. Like I don't always wanna, I, I, it's, it's really uncomfortable me for like th for me to throw under other people under the bus or whatever so that's where I feel like I change things mm. um, and then yeah of course I'll add like little jokes and stuff like a lot of the time the things that I change are actually like in the outfits or the patterns or the background where there's like little inside jokes that you can see in the background there but for the most part it's pretty pretty honest yeah I recently read uh, Lucy's book, Displacement. Mm -hmm. So fucking good. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. And, I, and, and so when I say that open or close, I'm not talking about the quality, but I am talking about that, that idea of like hiding yourself from your yeah. feelings or hiding yeah. your feelings away from yourself while making work. And that can be so effective too, because yeah. like in that book in particular, it's like you, it like really shook me, but there's not like, there's not like clarity to it, and I think that there's something really interesting in like shrouding that. Right. Um, yeah, but for for my work, I'm like, oh, it's I'm so it's like confessional, like just like really, it's all there. Mm. Uh, I mean, like I, I I say shit in my comics that like my closest friends don't know. I my friends like, oh my god, like I've sent my manuscript to some of my friends, and they're like, I just can't. Like, it feels weird to know this about you. And I'm like, <laughs> I totally get it, yeah. you know? Uh, it's weird to revisit, like, the stuff that I say and that I acknowledge um, is really wild. But for me, it is, like, the, the point of it for me is truth-telling yeah. and trying to get to the truth of what happened to me. So I'm not interested in tweaking things. I'm not protecting my abusers. Um, it, that's, like, a huge part of this is, like, I'm not holding their secrets anymore. Yeah. Um, so it's extremely important for me to be as honest as I can. But it, it's interesting because the first few like phases of this project, I was like really guarded because I was still with my biological family and feeling protective over them. So I wasn't, I was writing around things that happened to me. Yeah. Um, and that has really changed since I've gotten no contact. And it just like, an unintentional gift of that was freeing me to like really, really investigate uh, the things that happened to me and be able to like put that in in the comics work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. This is a great question though. Any other thoughts? Yes, uh, I feel like um, honesty is really important to me in my comics too. Like, uh, it's kind of like I'm trying to figure, like I'm not self-aware and through writing, I'm trying to figure out like what the truth is of like how I feel. Mm. Like I don't necessarily know when I start drawing what I'm trying to get out, but then when I start doing like the physical process, then that's when it like appears and then I'm like, okay, yeah, this is how I feel. Now I know. Um, yeah. Uh, that kind of reminds me of like one time, this is like an anecdote that probably might not make sense, but like um, me and my friend uh, Laura, we were like in a protest during like the George Floyd, like the, um, that, that happened during COVID and like a helicopter like swooped down like towards us, like really close and then like went back up and like it was like, it just like happened within like um, like seconds and it was kind of scary, but we just kept walking. And Laura, my friend Laura was just like, what happened there? And I was like, I don't know. And then she just went, I guess we'll never find out. 
And then I, I just feel like that moment, like, I'm just like, personally, I'm just like so concerned with like perspectives. And like um, with Autobio, it's like sharing a person's perspective. Um, as, a, as like throughout my life, I've always like witnessed like people talking to each other and like getting frustrated with each other. And then like as a viewer, you see, you can like see where both sides are coming from, or at least I can, or like I try to, just because like I like, I want to understand what's going on all the time. And then like, you just see like two elements trying to connect or like, um, uh, like solve something, but they're like both seeing different things of the same thing. I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly, but it's just like in the currents, everyone sees it, but the way they see it is different based on like where they are, who they are, um, where they're coming from, what they already know, what they don't know. And then that, it's just like all this, like it's just like many stories, I don't know. It's just like, I'm very like interested in that. And I feel like with the open and close, like it's like, it's for me it's not about like hiding something it's just like what happened here and like um yeah i don't know i, I think that right no, yeah. i don't know <laughs> you, you, you almost re recording as an act of keeping it all together so that you that you have a you have a sense of it after the fact yeah yeah i'm like so interested in like what's happening in the real world i i'm just like I like writing about real life because I think that's like the most interesting thing ever and nothing like fiction could ever be more like <coughs> interesting than that. Yeah, I, I, I think that's why I keep on coming back to all of your work is that you know, you have the sense of like, there's some new insight, there's some new, I think one of the things that good autobio does, and I think I can say this about all of your work is that it reminds me of the true connections that lie at the heart of the human experience, mm -hmm. that we are all kind of bound together in certain indelible ways that cannot be frayed. Um, but damn, does the world try to do that to us? The, like society, expectations, patriarchy, capitalism, et cetera, all those things kind of try to pull us apart when the reality is that we're all, we all have this shared set of desire shares set of needs mm -hmm. and I think that your work your work as a group helps me remember that as a critic as, as a publisher that's important to me um, one of the so there's a couple themes that have come up in the conversation and then also themes that I've seen in your work I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, one of those so one of those is sobriety or the act of getting uh, sober or moving towards that and another is religion and the potential uh, deleterious effects of religion. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to get a sense of like how you're kind of approaching these kind of like bigger issues, like because the, they're, they're really big, they're hard. And so I just kind of wanted to get a sense of like that in your work. Um, I'm just, let me, what am I gonna say? Uh, I guess with like writing about sobriety, I mean, I stopped drinking. Um, I still do other stuff, so I don't even know what to call, call myself <laughs> necessarily. But I kept seeing all of this work about people, or I just felt like I was seeing a lot of imagery about people getting sober and like celebrating that and feeling awesome. And that just like wasn't my experience at all. Like it sucks. Like it's hard. It's so hard. It's so uncomfortable. Like I was, I told myself I'm never going to, like if I stop drinking, like I'm never really going to go out again. It's like, that's kind of true. Like it's, I mean, I'm, I'm going on seven years. I mean, I haven't gone out, gone dancing or like done karaoke or, you know, it's just, it's, it's not that fun. I wouldn't say I'm thriving, but like, <laughs> so, so I feel like that's something, that's like a perspective that's important because yeah. I was feeling so alienated seeing these people like doing well. And I was like, <laughs> I guess I'm even bad at being, you know, sober, <laughs> what the fuck? So that's kind of, yeah, that's where I'm coming from with my stuff. 
I just want to say, uh, oh, sorry, your ahead. comics about sobriety and about addiction have meant like so much to Aww. me as a person like grappling with addiction. And I felt like so mirrored by your work. And I'm just That's like really awesome. grateful that you make work about that. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I just have to say that even in the midst of all that hell, you're still able to mine that stuff sometimes for some really funny work. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, you know, an, uh, and one of the things I will say is that all of you, there is always a sense of humor in the work. It mm -hmm. may, not, you know, it may be very, it may be pitch black humor, but mm -hmm. it is, it mm -hmm. is funny. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and so like, the the I, the I, Tara, one of the comics I think about yours all the time is the thing that's like, hi, you know, I'm Tara, I'm just sober, or like the, it's oh, like yeah. you're telling the house it's plan like the first thing sober. that comes out yeah, of my yeah, mouth. Yeah, it's like yeah. a trash can, and I'm saying, I'm sober to the trash can. Like, yeah. That was like the first two that's years. That's what I did when I met you. I was like, hi, I'm Kayla, I'm sober. Yeah. <laughs> And I just think, I think about that comic all the time because it's so funny, but then it's also like, it really speaks to something that's really intensely personal, intensely, in, in, intensely, um, you know, hard to kind of communicate. And I think that's, mm -hmm. it was, it, you know, just, it just strikes me as a, a like a pitch perfect, Aww, like, thanks. page, mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Any other thoughts about sobriety, religion? Yeah. Those are, you know, th those are just a couple of the many themes that I picked out. But oh, I, I have a lot to say, but I'll keep it short. Uh, <laughs> in terms of both of those are like very intimately connected for me. I grew up in, uh, like, my family was Pentecostal, fanatic, evangelical Christians. I, so this is this is a a, um, a depiction of when I uh, was exercised as a child because I had like a really severe eating disorder, um, and so instead of taking me to therapy because I was like a uh, abused child, you know, um, my bio mom like sent me to our Pentecostal church and so all these men were just like touching me and, you know, babbling in tongues and whatnot, um, which is actually like, I'm mixed on that. I think it's kind of fascinating, but it also was very scary at the time. Um, but so since then, I like really left my, uh, the tradition that I was raised in and I was an atheist starting from like a very young age, which for me personally was very intertwined with my addiction. So like pushing, pushing away from any sort of spiritual practice, like really was so in sync with getting super wasted and just like losing myself into like the void. And so it's been really fascinating that in sobriety, it's like softened my approach to the tradition that I was raised in um, and to just like faith traditions in general. I used to have very black and white thinking around that. And over time, I found that by pretending to believe in God, it kept me from drinking, which kept me from wanting to die. And eventually it's turned into something like really earnest and like kind of beautiful and real in my life. Um, and so the, the, the work that I'm, I have in the book um, is mostly about my traumatic relationship with alcohol um, and drugs and Christianity. And the work that I'm sort of making now that's coming after is like really investigating how my spiritual practice and my faith has actually like sort of given me a new life and like been the bed that has held me as I've lost my family um, and been like entirely alone in the world and kind of creating this sort of like, it's like magical thinking, I describe it, like way of, of thinking about God as like a caretaker or like a, a mother-father figure. Um, and so the, the work I'm making most recently is like really investigating that, um, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, almost like a de you have to, you have to deconstruct the things that are, that are toxic in that mm -hmm. in order to find purpose or meaningfulness and, and what, your, what your spiritual needs are now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I was raised Catholic, and um, I feel like, you know, when I was a kid, I was super worried about going to hell mm -hmm. and things of that nature and trying to be good and, like, do everything right. And then I feel like when you kind of have that pressing on you as a child, it usually, like, backfires and you realize, like, um, you know, you kind of get wild with it. And you're like, once you realize nothing matters, <laughs> you're like... Um, kind of just ball out. Um, so <laughs> as an adult, I'm kind of like a hedonist, um, and I just like see things that will bring me joy, um, which is like sometimes drugs and sometimes like, you know, just whatever I want. But it, um, 
back to the Catholicism, I feel like part like when you're a Catholic, if you want to like be forgiven of your sins, you have to confess to the priest. And I feel like some aspect of that is related to autobio comics because it is like confessional. Yeah. So it's kind of like autobio's hard. Like, yeah. I feel like it's like it's not just the drawing, it's like it's like um what am I actually like why am I putting this on paper? Why am I just like, you know, memorializing so, because sometimes it's like about something embarrassing that happened and it's like why am I doing this? So it, I relate to the confessional. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I, and I did want to move a little bit forward just because we're running you know, I've I've done the thing that I always do which is it gets so wrapped up in what you guys are talking <laughs> about that I've lost track of time. Um, and recognizing that I wanted to at least bring a little bit of humor to the conversation because um, your comics are, s Ooh. all of your comics, they are really funny. Um, I Like when I read this comic for the first time, I was walking around the house saying, I'm gonna fuck this car for, <laughs> for literally days. So, um, it, you know, there's something that's like really magical about that sense of, of finding that perfect space where humor meets the human experience and how you can connect with someone more deeply through making them laugh. So I just wanted to, you know, get your thoughts on like how or how you think how are you thinking about making it funny or how are you thinking about using humor? Is it is it a defense mechanism? Is it something to draw people in so you can really catch them? What's the what's the what's the process? Or is it just like my life is funny and I write down funny things because that's what happened to me. Oh, I feel like humor is like the, you know, it's kind of like one of the joys in life. So if you can, you know, a lot of times we're writing about like really dark and like embarrassing and uh, real things. And so you kind of have to find the humor in it to like bring some like, make it kind of like worthwhile. Like this is why this was funny. I think I definitely use it as a defense mechanism. Um, I also, like I grew up with like pretty like physically and emotionally abusive parents and like one way to deal with that is like making everything a joke, making yourself the joke. Um, but there's like another aspect of it that's kind of interesting where it's like my comics are really honest, but maybe like it would be more honest if there weren't jokes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time like putting something really like sincere and per maybe like cringy per <laughs> out there that doesn't have a joke sometimes. So maybe that's like something something that I could work on. Um, yeah, like I like the idea of taking myself too seriously mm. is something that I really struggle with, but it's also just like part of my personality, I think. Uh, I, f I find like y I try to use humor really specifically and carefully in my work. And I'm like, I really think a lot about it when I put it there. And I think that for me, the introduction of like the, the funny aspect of my work is really to just like lessen the self-seriousness of, of memoir comics, especially memoir comics about childhood trauma. Like it, this shit is so serious and it's so heavy and it's so dark. And like I, at times, like I can just tell like, I really need a gag in here, you know? Like, this is just gonna destroy my readers. Uh, so, I, I, and I think that, like, so many of us who are, like, survivors of various, just, like, hardships in life, like, it's really fun to connect with each other and laugh about the shit that we've been through, you know? Like, I especially find with other people, you know, who have uh, experience with addiction that just, like, there's such this amazing, like, immediate understanding of just, like, how funny the crazy shit that we've done fucked up is. It's like so fun to talk to other people who have that kind of shared trauma. Like, so I find that that is an opening into my work too, where it's not just a wall of grief, um, mm -hmm. which I, I'm just not, I'm not interested in making that kind of work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left, and so I wanted to open things up to questions. 
So um, we've got, let's see, we have uh, microphones on the sides of the stage. Um, I, I, if you're stuck in the middle of a bunch of people, I can try to uh, repeat questions for the recording. But if you'd like your voice, your own voice to be on our uh, SPX recording, which will be going up on YouTube at some point, uh, please feel free to head to the microphones now. Can, can I just add that, like, um, I take myself way too seriously. That's my problem. And I think that's why it's funny, because it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> what are you crying about? <laughs> like, one, like, one comic I made called Finder, it's just like so much self-damnation. And then, like, I was, like, really in pain while drawing this, because I was, like, pouring my soul into, like, on the page. And then when, I, when my friends read it, they were laughing. <laughs> and, but it was good. Like, I was just like, you're right. <laughs> you're so right. <laughs> so it's, yeah. <laughs> That's all. It's, it's great to get a new perspective about your work. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. I think we're going to start over here, and then we'll flip and back and forth. Okay. Um. Oh, all right. Uh, shout, shout, yeah. shout it out loud, and I'll repeat it for the for the microphone. Sorry. Okay, so like memoir is like a very personal like genre to embark in with like comics. Um, to like a certain extent, you're uh, commodifying your experience mm -hmm. and you're sort of selling it to the world. Mm -hmm. Like, what's your relationship to sort of like that barrier between like your personal life and like that sort of like commodification? Like, do you even think about how you're commodifying? So the question for the recording is the act of making autobio comics is largely an act of commodification, essentially making a, you know, when you're making a comic, you're making a product for someone else to read and however you engage with the capitalist structure of that. So how do you think about the balance between what you're doing for, as an art perspective and what you're doing from a commodified perspective? Does that capture? Yeah. Okay. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the ickiest feeling. Um, I guess I thought that like over time, as my like as my stuff was published more, like now I have this drawn in quarterly book, I thought it would be easier for me to put my stuff out there. But now I, my, I just feel like my character has become this symbol that it, that feels like related to money <laughs> in some way, and it's actually become like a lot harder for me to make work with this, yeah, this character in mind, or it feels like removed from why I started to make comics mm -hmm. to begin with. And like, it's also like, it's really tied up in money. So mm -hmm. I am thinking about what's going to sell or what other people might want to see. And instead of that pushing me to make things, it just makes me stop. Mm. Mm. Man, I, I love selling my shit. I'm like a used car salesman, man. It's like, I don't know why. I mean, I guess I get it because it's like I'm at the I'm at the end of like telling these like horrific stories. And it's like I want something out of this. And like that something for me is like getting my work read by people. And so like I'm not making any money at this. Like I have a full time job. You know, it's like two dollars, three dollars every time I get a pre order. Um, but it's like I'm like really pushing to get people to read my work. And I'm a graphic designer by trade, so I'm really thinking about branding, making sure that everything is like this bright, punchy package to like bring people in. And I've just like I click into this mode of just like selling it. I don't <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm deranged. I don't know. It might not be a good thing, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I just like fully dissociate when I'm tabling too. So I'm not really thinking about like the, the deeper, what does it mean to be like, like slinging comics about like That's incest, good. you know? It's like, oh, it's probably something to unpack there, but it is what it is. Like I'm making this work and I want people to read it. Like if people don't read it, then there was no point in suffering through the creation of this work. Mm. Um, and yeah, so it's just like, yeah. it's, it's such a great question too. I've never even really like, thought about that or put words to that, but just like really, really deep, complex questions, good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the desire for connection is so great that mm -hmm. it's, that, that doesn't care, I don't care how many, you know, if it means that you have to throw some money at me so that we can have this connection, let's do it. Yeah. Because yeah. I need that, you know, yeah. that, that's really fascinating. I feel like it, like, it just, for, for me, it's like, it feels like there's an expectation now a little bit because certain things did get popular and I feel like mm -hmm. people are yeah they, it feels a little bit scary to like 
move in a different direction. Like oh, even yeah. even with like yeah. just making black and white comics that aren't all bright and distracting with patterns and stuff or other things. Yeah, I just feel like there's a little bit less freedom, but that's mostly in my, my mind anyway. It's like just giving your work its due diligence. Like you just have to like, you know, respect that you made this thing and we live in this world. You can't like, I would love to just you know, give my comics for free in the park and then everyone reads it. <laughs> but it's like, we don't live in that world. Like, it's, you can't escape it, you can't pretend. Um, you know, yeah, I just have to say like my, uh, my me and Knight, it is, like for me, it's relatively expensive because like of how it's made. So it's like an art object. So I also think about this question a lot. Um, and, um, I don't know, I just think that, and then people buy it. Um, and I think that like money has meaning because like this is the world we live in, we give it meaning. And like even though I don't agree, it's like you have to like face the truth of the fact that like money, you know, has value. And then sometimes people who want to buy something are investing in it. Um, so that's just how I wrap my mind around it, even though it does feel icky. We're also not like rolling in dough, so, no. I, so I'm like, why are we yeah, like exactly. hating on ourselves yeah. about it? Like, so painters dope. will sell paintings for like twenty thousand, you know? Uh -huh. Like, I don't like know. I don't need to feel bad selling a twenty-five dollar book yeah. exactly. of four hundred paintings. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> that's so true. That's so true. No so one who's making so comics true. is making a ton of money. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you for that great question. Let's flip over to this side. This conversation has been so awesome. It's been great watching you all listen to one another. Um, the question is, have you ever done something in life because you're thinking this is going to be great to write? Uh, and the context of this is I studied with the novelist Reynolds Price. And when we talked about how he began writing fiction, because I could identify things on the novels that were definitely from his life, he was like, when I was a kid, I would do stuff so I could write it in my diary, and it got dicey and dangerous, so I had to move to fiction. Um, thank you all so much. I feel like that's like for a male artist. Oh my god! <laughs> I don't. <Yeah>. Really. <laughs> I don't. I feel like it's like a male thing. I don't know. Only I'm sorry. Boys do not, that. To, not to genderize. I don't know. I feel like I, I'm making co like. Yeah, to the point where it's like I could, I should leave my house today so I have something to write about. Otherwise, I wouldn't do anything. I would just like, you know, like my comics are getting boring because it's all about like being sh a shut in. <laughs> so I think it's, I think I definitely will do things like to write about them, but it'll just be like boring stuff like going to visit a friend I haven't seen in like two months. Or okay, I'm sorry. I take back what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's just like sometimes you have to do something to get inspiration, but it's uh, kind of the other way around too, where it's like when something terrible happens, like you can kind of justify it and be like, wow, that sucked. That was like my 9 11, you know? And then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It, uh, but then you're like, okay, but this is going to make a great comic. <laughs> Are we going to start talking about 9 11 now? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's not. And unfortunately, we're out of time. I, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like curtain hook you after we start talking about 9/11. No, uh, unfortunately, it is we we have actually run out of time. Um, and I know that were some questions that were left over at the end of the session. So um, hopefully, you guys would be willing to stick around outside of the the hall for a few minutes to a answer any questions. But um, thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. Could we give them another round of applause? So come find me. Pre-order my book. <laughs> Banographics table, drawn and quarterly table, cram books. You know where to go. I'm, C I'm C14A. I'm C not on the program guide, but I'm C14A. <laughs> Head on over after the after this the this is all said and done. Uh, we're gonna wrap up, move everybody out for the next panel. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you. <laughs>